especially when we're looking at something like, you know, uh, hemoglobin A1C, there's a major whole body insulin sensitization that can occur with resistance training and with, and with physical activity in general. This is Generation Health. Every week we bring you the latest in news, cutting edge research and time tested best practices, helping you live a longer, healthier life. Farm D, certified strength and conditioning specialist, Dante DiMatteo. How are you, my friend? Not too bad, Tyler. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We're in the good. holidays. It's good. Looking forward to all things to come. This is, this is one of my favorite times of year. It's a great time. Josiah Schweinberg, engineer <laughs> extraordinaire, third mic writer. How are you? Doing well. Got my green holiday shirt on. Is so. that what that is? Sure. You should put some more bells on it. I don't have a Christmas sweater. Maybe next year. Christmas Actually, no, I do have a Christmas sweater. It has a T-Rex on it with a scarf. Yeah. Nicole got me a uh, Christmas sweater last year with our cats on them. Oh, well, that's not awesome. our really our cats, but cats because we have cats. I'm, thank you for that clarification. I was going to be I'm going to wear that. I like the sweaters that light up. People that have the batteries in them, they light them up. It's wild. And when they is. get lit, they I light see, up. I see them around the office sometimes. Mm. It, it's insane. Okay, this this episode is off to a wild start. My name is Tyler Andrews. I am your host. Dante, what are we talking about other than Christmas sweaters? <laughs> we are going to talk about a study regarding strength training in diabetics. Okay, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. That sounds interesting. Does Shall, it though? I mean, it does. You, But I'm not diabetic, but I'm still curious where we go mm, with this. Yeah. All right. First, talking about Pharmacy news, things going on behind the counter. Uh, we'll start with some good news. SIBO has officially been given codes in the ICD-11. If, if you've been diagnosed with SIBO but struggled to get medication or further testing because insurance doesn't cover it, you should probably go try again. The International Classification of Diseases, or ICD, is a massive collection of alphanumeric codes for every possible disease, injury, complication, and more. Doctors, hospitals, researchers, they all use this database, these codes, to make sure that they're talking about the same thing. Insurers use these codes as well, and when covering things, doctors prescribe, but if your diagnosis doesn't have an ICD code, the insurance company probably isn't going to cover whatever the treatment is that the doctor is looking for. For years, that's been the case for SIBO. That's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. If you're curious, you can go listen to episode two of this show. We did a whole big thing on it. Wow, it was way back. It wow. was. That was way back. That was over 30 episodes ago. Uh, if your doctor has diagnosed you with IBS, there are certain treatments that they would cover. But if the doctor said SIBO, well, the insurance just wasn't going to cover that because there wasn't a code for it. So... Um, now that it has been, uh, updated and there is actually a code, it might be worth going to try and get that all covered again. Very we exciting should, stuff. We should revisit SIBO soon. Yeah. yeah. We can do that in the new year, especially. That's a new good idea. New year, new SIBO. Oh no. New SIBO. terrible. <laughs> new SIBO research? Yeah. There new you go. Cibo. There you go. Um, new year, no SIBO. I like that even better. Um, this next story, uh, we had something else lined up, but when we started talking about this in the office uh, in a pre-production meeting, it got to be a really fun conversation, so we thought we'd share it with you guys. Yeah, we started, we were fighting. We did, we scrapped. <laughs> if you see the black eye that I gave Dante, it was over this. A major national healthcare provider made headlines recently unintentionally when they notified parents of an update to their app. Employees of Atrium Health Services were notified that their access to the pharmacy records of their children, ages 12 to 17, would be revoked. Atrium Health said the move, quote, allows minors to receive prescription medication for sensitive issues as permitted by law without worrying about how their parents may react, unquote. Upon further research, it became clear that they were referring to legislation from the 1970s in North Carolina that gives minors the right to consent to certain specific medical treatments without parental consent. There are laws like this in lots and lots of states. Those uh, treatments were limited to things like birth control, STDs, uh, psychiatric care, and substance abuse care. Why Atrium Health has suddenly decided to limit parents' access to all pharmaceutical records uh, is, at this point, unanswered. I did a little more digging, and it looks like this particular law came uh, comes into the spotlight 
every few years. Mm-hmm. Um, in January of 2022, so just a, a couple years ago, I found another article about a mom being refused a drug test for her minor daughter that she wanted to have her daughter drug tested, and they said, without the child's consent, we can't do that. It was it was interesting. So it seems like this is um, kind of a clickbaity, rage-farming sort mm-hmm. of topic that comes up every once in a while. Yeah. But because it brought up a fun conversation, uh, I thought it would be fun to, for us to talk about it on a more philosophical level. You had an interesting uh, reaction to this. I got angry immediately, mm-hmm. and you didn't. Mm-hmm. Why was that? Yeah, it at my first reaction, it was interesting because it made me think of children, teenagers who are maybe afraid to talk about certain subjects with mm-hmm. their parents, specifically, you know, various controversial medical issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, again, just at first reaction, not that this is my full go, full tilt belief in it. Right. It's just, it's, it's a, it was kind of nice thinking about, oh, wow, there is some potential advocacy for, again, for, for children, for teenagers who just don't have the most open lines of communication, don't have the same beliefs potentially as their parents. Sure. And so having this level of, of privacy, even though maybe their decision-making skills, their knowledge base all that sort of thing, even though maybe it's not as developed as a 18, 25 year old, something like that. That is definitely true. It's still, it's just, it just was interesting again, like you're saying that that was my first reaction. Right. Mm-hmm. I got immediately angry cause that's what mm-hmm. I do. Um, <laughs> but no, it was, it was a fun conversation because from there we started talking and I said, okay, well, what, what about the parental rights element of this. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole point, the reason my child can't get a tattoo, the reason my child um, can't smoke cigarettes or buy alcohol is because we all kind of universally agree that where that line might be changes from person to person. As a society, we've kind of generally agreed that it's 18 years old. Mm -hmm. That's when you're an adult. That's when you can make adult decisions. Sure. For the most part. But if I'm responsible for my child's well-being and care why in the world would I not be given access to their medical records? That's a a pretty fundamental thing. And again, we want to stress, this is is a relatively small group of folks. These were all employees of a single uh, hospital network, you know, and folks that live in North Carolina. There are other laws similar to it in other states, but it's just an interesting thought conversation. Mm -hmm. I understand wanting to you know, the substance abuse thing is a perfect example. If, if a child is going to, a minor is going to seek treatment for substance abuse and they don't want their parents to know because they don't want to deal with that, they just want to get the help and move on, I get that. And that's a positive thing. But shouldn't a parent have access to all of the medical records of their child? Mm-hmm. I mean, what if, um, you know, I mean, we, can, we can take this apart with a thousand different what ifs, but sure. psychiatric medications, those have, black box warnings, those are, those have significant potential complications in certain people. Mm-hmm. If I, as your parent, don't even know that you're on those, sure. like that could be a problem. I can't watch for, for side effect profiles that I don't know that you're taking those medications, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that parents should never have access to their ch- child's records. No, you didn't <laughs> no. say that. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it, it, Again, it's to me a lot a lot of these thoughts that I have around such heated topics like yes, this, such yeah. debatable topics, I again, my reaction is more just consider just reactively considering the flip side before I jump before I dive into, oh my goodness, this is how I feel. We, this is bad. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. Like, right. Before I go there, it's like, all right, what if we what if we spun this? Like is this really that bad? Because our tendency is still really to jump on the heated aspects of health privacy. Yeah. Do you know, you know what we're trying to say? I do. I do. And yes, you, you so, have a wonderful capacity to see things from multiple sides and kind of hold an idea loosely. Mm-hmm. To a fault, to a fault sometimes. Sure. I don't do that at all, <laughs> ever. I make up my mind. You're laughing over there. I am. Are you laughing because <laughs> I have made up my mind? No, no, I just, I, I agree. With 
your perspective of Dante and <laughs> what do you think? About and, I'll, and I'll ride the third mic back here behind the uh, sound console. You don't want to jump in on this. You got kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just think, I think, you know, Dante's perspective is one that's, you know, he's, he's, you know, recalling his, you know, parental mm-hmm. uh, guidance at a young age. Yeah. Um, but also at this stage of life doesn't have children. Yes, that's true. Um, and so I think there's, there's probably a lot of people who have different, perspectives or opinions about this based on their life. Yep. You know, their current life situation or life journey, those types of things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this it's is a surprise, a, it's but a it's no one. surprise. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's a surprise, but it's no surprise. I think, um, you know, like a lot of the comments and stuff that I'm reading on some of these articles that are, that are posted they're you know, saying a similar thing, you know, like, you know, a lot of the people that are commenting on here probably don't have children like, right. and that shows like what ignorance and all this stuff. And it's like, well, I mean, no. Um, and the other thing I think that is interesting to highlight too, is, you know, one of the questions on here, which I had and Dante, you would be able to kind of weigh in on this a little bit is, um, someone asked if a child is on their parents' insurance, wouldn't the parent know about the prescriptions? And they say no, because that's, that's everything's the sent point. electronically. Yep. Yeah. And you can't you can log in, but you can't see any of that. They could change providers and you wouldn't even wouldn't even know that. I just like But that's you're that, driving them to the appointment because they don't have a license because sixteen years not old. Not necessarily. Is, Twelve years old. Well, you can get an Uber. Or somebody could get one for you. A friend could take you. Yeah, I suppose. There's all kinds of situations. But aside from that, I mean, because we can we can really turn this into all sure. kinds of conspiracy theories and things like that. This is an old law. This is from the 1970s. That's what somebody commented. Yeah. They're, it like, is, is it, they're like, is this even a headline? This is yeah. a 70s. This is from the 1970s. Why is this even a headline? Because it comes up every couple of years and it makes for good mm-hmm. clickbaity titles and stuff. And it is interesting. But yeah. The the one part that came to my mind in reflecting on this a bit more is we, it seems like at least I don't have this answer, right. but we, we jump to 16 is when you get your license. 18 is when you can buy tobacco products. 18 is when you can do X or Y. Yeah. It's, it is the best guess. Yeah. They're the best guesses that we have as far as, somebody being mature enough, somebody having the adequate ability to make certain decisions. So it's still, that that's still something that I would imagine really falls on a range. Yes. You know, sure. there could be, there very well may be freshmen in, high, freshmen in high school who potentially have a, have a greater capacity to think about their, to think about a given health issue, let's mm-hmm. say in this context, than some 18 year olds and 19 oh. year olds. So it's it's like so my mind jumps to okay what if we just look at this on an individual by individual basis it's just it's just the the premise like yeah. the, my argument against you for the for example the other day is yeah. just that that the premise is flawed like i don't really buy into the fact that 18 means means anything mm-hmm. anyway 100%. it's not like when our kids turn 18 it's like well then I don't have the right to know what you're taking. Your your, your 18 year old could be a goofball for, 100%. for all intents and purposes. I know some 45 you year know? olds that do not need to be picking their own medications. And so that like, it's that color on the conversation. That's like, okay, 12. Yeah. In my logical mind, a 12 year old making a big decision on a, maybe starting a new medication that they don't want to involve their guardians in seems like a much bigger deal than an 18 year old. Sure. But what about, yeah. Yeah. What about 17 year old? What about everybody in the middle? It's just that there, there are certainly, well, we have certainly, we have to draw a line somewhere as a society. Mm -hmm. And so that's just where we've chosen to draw it for whatever reason. Uh But yeah, there's gradients and there's, there's different levels of this. But I think the issue that, that scares me and scares other parents Mm -hmm. is the complete, shutdown of access to all pharmaceutical mm-hmm. records. That was shocking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I just, what I don't like is when people like fear monger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is what this article was about. Yeah. Sure. And, and so, you know, like we vaguely touched on, there are a lot of other health things, you know, currently going on and changes to age and all like all of these things. And like, 
you know, you hear some of these like stories and it's like, well, I don't want to be locked out completely. And right. then like, what if they take my child away from me? And like the spiral goes sure. yep. and you know, if, if I'm going to be that guy, like the Bible talks very clearly on not, not having a spirit of fear. Yep. Um, and so, and amongst a lot of other very uh, beneficial life giving things. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I, I don't buy into a lot of the fear mongering. Should we be, should we be, um, aware of this? Absolutely. Yeah. But we should also not be afraid, you know, as parents. And I don't, I'm not saying that you are like, you know, we should, and we also sh- shouldn't be surprised, you know, as the world, ag- again, if we're living with a biblical worldview where yes. you're looking through the lens of scripture, some of this is like no surprise, but, um, but can be alarming. So the conclusion that I came to upon further thought, after we talked, I went for a long walk and I just kept thinking about it. And what I finally realized was, I think, as with so many things, a problem in this case, getting your access to your kids' pharmaceutical records shut down, a problem is just a, uh, uh, um, an opportunity with work clothes on, right? It's an opportunity if you're willing to put in the work. And I think the opportunity here mm-hmm. is a chance to double down on your child learning that they can trust you. And yeah. that, that these lines of communication might be awkward and uncomfortable, um, but that just assuming that you're going to know everything doesn't work, because it's not like prior to the 1970s, kids never hid things from their parents, sure. right? right? And, and it's not like just because, I mean, obviously there's a million stories now we can find about kids getting access to all sorts of intense pharmaceuticals that... Mm-hmm. that they didn't get on any legal basis and there's nobody watching what they're doing. So it, it, that's all true. This is an opportunity and a reminder, as far as I can tell, mm-hmm. that that the best path is not to trust that the government's gonna get me access or the health insurance companies are gonna get me access, but that I have to develop an intimate relationship with my child mm-hmm. who knows that they can trust me no matter what the situation is, no matter what the challenge is, they can be honest with me and it might be awkward and uncomfortable and not fun, but that we're both going to tackle the problem together instead of tackling each other. Yep. Mm-hmm. And that's what this really felt like is it, it, it almost pits scared kids against scared parents. It, it does. And that's not helpful for anybody. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts? I mean, there's a lot of thoughts, but I think you guys, <laughs> I think you guys summed it up perfectly. It, it, it's an opportunity more than it is something to, you know, get all hopped up, hopped up about. And, yep. And can I say one more thing? Absolutely. Uh, and even in Dante's current situation, like just big role model in niece and nephew's lives, like having that family unit. So like maybe, maybe there's not as much comfortability coming to the parents, right. but to the, the brother, the uncle, the, you know, this, yeah. and then, you know, then it's up to the uncle to say like, Oh, you should like encourage, Hey, talk, talk to your, talk to your mom, your dad about this. You know, like this is important. That's one of the things when, when we gave our kids cell phones, they never got cell phones until they were 14. I think, um, what we put in them before I handed them the phone was I put phone numbers for half a dozen adult friends of the same gender Mm -hmm. as them and said, these are people that your mom and dad trust Mm -hmm. that have all agreed to talk to you anytime you want that Mm -hmm. will not tell us anything we don't need to know. So if you need somebody to talk to that's not your mom or dad, these are people you can trust. Yeah. And, and you get to be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great point. The network there, there is a, uh, a great advantage to working with a bigger network if, if, possible we're not supposed to do it alone Mm -hmm. we're not so anyway absolutely yeah it's really good stuff well bringing back to the uh subject matter of the day the reason we're all here uh a (laughs) stan stanford just released a big study that we thought was interesting and we wanted to share it with you guys uh this is an article from article from the new york post it says the stanford study quote has found those who did strength training lost more fat and had better blood sugar maintenance than those who did cardio or a combination of both Researchers from Stanford University looked at nearly 200 people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes who participated in a nine-month exercise routine of strength trading, cardio, or both. Findings published in the journal Diabetologia. Oh, wow. I've got a, I've got a subscription to that. 
uh, showed that the group that went through just strength training exercises had better progress doing workouts such as shoulder presses and leg presses three times a week compared to those who utilized the treadmill, elliptical, or stationary bike. One workout of strength training might not stave off as many calories as a cardio workout, but because it builds muscle tissue, which requires more energy to maintain, it can ultimately burn more calories overall. Okay, that article did not mention diabetes, or at least the portion that I read, but you said that was part of the study. Mm -hmm. Huge part of the study. Okay, so yeah, once so the, again, we can't just trust headlines because they left that art out. That out. Yeah. So the, I mean, the title of the study: "Strength training is more effective than aerobic exercise for improving glycemic control and body composition in people with normal weight type two diabetes." A randomized control trial. <laughs> That's a beautiful title. Maybe they got to do really, a better job with the titles. They do. They do. That's, I, I like that it tells you what it's studying, but at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people with type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. normal weight, mm -hmm. strength training alone mm -hmm. does a better job of controlling blood sugar long term. So that, this was, to be clear, this was an article in the New York Post that cited this other study so that the New York Post, yeah, they didn't bring anything. <laughs> they liked the clickbaity headline. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead. So much, much of the research that's out there is specifically looking at, well, exercise interventions like this, type 2 diabetic or non-diabetic, they, they often look at what, what will these given you know, aerobic exercise interventions, strength, strength interventions, combination interventions, what will they do for individuals with obesity or overweight? Sure. And so the fact, it sounds so innocuous, it sounds so whatever, but there is a, I think in the study it talks about there being a 20, I think there was 20 or 25% of individuals with type 2 diabetes are, have normal BMI. And so there's this assumption that, okay, what else can we do for them as far as exercise goes? If they already have their BMI is good, they must be physically in a, you know, in an optimal state. Sure. Let's say. But there are, so for them to take this specific subset and, you know, randomize them to some different, you know, some specific exercise interventions, I thought was, was very useful. Now the study ended up being underpowered. Uh, this, this was conducted during the heat of COVID shutdowns. And <sighs> so it ended up, you know, cutting their, uh, interventions, cutting their interventions in half or something. Oh, wow. So I think they, sh they were shooting for two or 300, two or 300, uh, participants. I think that was more like 150 or 180. Wow. Something like that. So it ended up hurting them. And, um, therefore we have to be cautious in what we extrapolate from this, but, as always, um, we look to the overarching body of research to see if this, just kind of see where does this point. If it pointed the opposite way, right, then you could say, okay, um, interesting. But yeah. we know it's it's you know it's underpowered. It's a small study. Needs some follow up. Needs something a little sturdier. Um, but also, if it points in that direction, I mean, you kind of say the same thing. It's, yeah. But it's, but at the same time, I think even what they mention is that it can allow us to further personalize exercise recommendations. And so in this case, again, people with type two diabetes at a normal BMI, which is a huge that's po a, population. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the, that's sort of the gist of it from that end. So what was the, what's the punchline? What, what, how much of a difference did strength training make versus the other mm -hmm. uh, interventions. Mm -hmm. So the primary outcome was the absolute change in hemoglobin A1C. That's a big deal for type mm -hmm. 2 diabetics. Yeah, and so they looked at this at three, six, three, six and nine months out. Mm -hmm. The secondary outcomes included changes in body composition at nine months. So, so that two, wasn't two the primary goal, but it was a secondary mm -hmm. measurement. Okay. And so what they saw was the that most notably there, there were, there was greater reductions in hemoglobin A1C in the strength only group versus the combination group. 
which was strength training and aerobic training, right? And versus the aerobic training by itself. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And so again, it it brings about that idea that the that there's there's something to be said about the you know the muscle mass that we have, and also the attainment mm -hmm. of muscle mass. There's so there's something going on in resistance training, not only just packing on the muscle mass, but right. also in the process of doing it, there's something to be said about a, a variety of health outcomes, especially when we're looking at something like, you know, uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is your average, basically your average, uh, blood glucose over, over X amount of time. Right. And so it's just, it's proof that there's, you know, again, it, there's, it converges on the evidence that already says there's a, there's a major whole body insulin sensitization that can occur with resistance training and with, and with physical activity in general. Okay. So going way outside of my realm of knowledge, just based on what I've learned doing this show with you, um, the muscles themselves, the muscle tissue absorbs the glucose out of the blood, correct? Essentially. Yes. So is the thinking then that by creating more muscle, mm -hmm. you're able to absorb more glucose out of the bloodstream? Essentially, yes. That makes a lot of sense, but that's mm -hmm. fascinating that that it yeah, it point it all points in that direction. And now that's again, that that's one there's a bunch of there are other mechanisms at play in the periphery. You know, they call it in one paper they talk about it as organ crosstalk. So it's not just okay. like it's yeah, not yeah. just the the you know, the muscle and the glucose and the benefit and that's it. There's there are other there are things happening in the pancreas. There's things happening in your in circulation. Yeah, it's there's a complex system. Yes. There's a system. There's a systematic. There's a systemic, you know, change occurring. But if we want to look at what's the benefit of building muscle tissue, I think you're absolutely right in that there is an increase in glucose uptake from the blood by building muscle and like doing this, doing the stuff. Yeah, do you know, I think thing. some of that goes away as you stop exercising. Sure, but continuing to do the thing. You can you can continue to realize those benefits. That's great for sure. So, this again, you said this was specifically for normal body weight, um, type two diabetics. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason to think that this wouldn't be true for everybody, whether you're diabetic or not? There, are, I mean, there are probably studies that look at the changes in. Glyce I mean, there are, there are studies that show that there's an improved capacity for glycemic control in non-diabetics. It's just that the, you know, taking your hemoglobin A1C from out of the normal range to lower in the non-normal range right. to potentially back into the normal range versus if you're somebody already at a good level to, to further reduce it. What is, I know you're, you know, you're reducing a lab value, let's right, say. Right, right, right. But clinically, what is that, what is that doing? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't it's necessarily. Not, it's not, it's certainly not harming you. Right. You know, and sure. I think it, I think there's, there's this analogy everywhere uh, and it applies here that when you don't just stop taking your blood pressure medication when your blood pressure normalizes. Right. Ideally, you don't just stop doing, you know what I mean? You don't just stop the intervention as soon as it works. It's it's the continuation of that. I might have every once in a while. But. Yeah, I mean that that's actually not even really what I wanted to say, but it's really just this analogy of the physical four hundred one k. So you continue to bank the volume, you continue to bank the exercise, you continue to you view it as just this accumulate you know this accumulation of good behaviors and physical characteristics. Yeah, you know then if then it. Put you in a it it makes you more resilient against you know maybe some of these negative changes in this context to maybe glycemic control. Sure. So it's tough. A very long answer to say that it probably helps in the normal. Yeah. In the normal population and the healthy and healthy subjects, but again, just keeping it focused here, I do like that it you know again it it highlights a group that is is they say relatively sarcopenic. So, what does that mean, sarcopenic? So essentially have a decrease in muscle and they have a decrease in the capability of the muscle. So they're under-muscled, under essentially. Okay. And so that's the, 
you know, I think that's another big point of this is so maybe it's that's one thing, you know, it's in the, the, the other way that they highlighted this was that in the other studies, individuals with obesity, overweight, type two diabetics, they have higher fat mass percentage, right? But they also, because of just the added body weight, they actually do carry higher amounts of lean mass. Yes. And so that in and of itself kind of knocks them out of the sarcopenic category. Interesting. And in those, in, in studies where they've done similar interventions, they don't see necessarily as high of a benefit on hemoglobin A1C from strength training alone. In, the, in that overweight, o- obese category, they see, you see more of a benefit in combination. You see more of a benefit in aerobic training. Sure. And so maybe that's, to, again, that just comes back to this idea of potentially individualizing treatment or again, you want to get to the point where you're doing all of these things. You're you're, you're getting to the point you want to do a lot of all of these things, but it's hard to get somebody to do all of these things and a lot of these things sustainably and for the long term. So when you're, when you're working with somebody or you're working with yourself, what's, what's the low hanging fruit? What's going to maybe get me the most benefit the soonest. Right. I'm not saying that this paper gives us that answer 100%, but again, type two diabetic, normal weight. What's the harm in focusing on putting on some lean mass first? Yeah. And then eventually building in a little more conditioning, building a little more resistance training, you know, so, cause eventually you got to move the needle anyway, right. you got to progress anyway. It's just, again, I, I like it from the perspective of, of individualizing at recommendations. I, I like what you just said there, because that was the next question, of course, is, well, if, if this is what has the biggest bang for the buck, then I don't ever have to run again, right? Mm-hmm. And you're saying, no, it, it's, it's all of the above. Mm-hmm. But for someone who has that specific uh, shortcoming or need, take those low-hanging fruits. It's, it's hard enough to start any new habit. It's nearly impossible to start multiple new habits at the same time, especially things that need to be lifestyle changes over a very long period of time. Mm-hmm. You're saying, Forget all that. Just focus on the one thing that is going to give you the biggest re, uh, uh, response in the short term first. Mm-hmm. Develop that habit, gain some benefits, and then move on to the next thing. Yeah. I like that. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? Anything else in this? There, There is. There's quite a bit. Um, I, I think that, again, we could probably talk about a lot of this for a long time. What was but, the, what were the interventions, the exercises specifically mm-hmm. that they, um, really liked for the strength training and all that jazz? Yeah. The, the one part that really stuck out to me was the sheer volume that they gave to the strength training only group. Okay. So it was three days a week, nine exercises per session, nine exercises per yeah. session. How many sets per yeah. exercise? So there was, it was four exercises times two sets each upper body, three exer- three leg exercises times three sets each, one lower back exercise times two sets e- times two <laughs> sets, one core, one abdominal exercise times two sets. So it's 29 sets if I or 21 sets if I just did my math. Right. It's a lot of sets. Did they walk after this or like, right. <laughs> are they and still so mobile? They claim the intensity of the strength training program was low initially to reduce muscle soreness yeah, go figure. and ensure proper lifting form. I find if you, I like to think that I've done a decent amount of exercise <laughs> or at least I'm tall, like I'm tolerating exercise right now. Yes. That if you gave me this routine, 21 sets, like it, it's, it's probably going to make the second session and the third session of the week probably kind of crappy. Yeah. You know, so Maybe I'm interpreting it wrong. Maybe they titrated them up to that point. Sure. I don't think that they did. Um, so, you know, they they say, again, they say, oh, yeah, well, we we increased the intensity slowly. So they're saying we inte- we increased the loading yeah, yeah. slowly. And that's fine. Start with small weights, go to bigger ones. That's fine. Yeah. But, but that's one piece. I mean, you could do... If you did three sets of 10 on an exercise, I don't care how light it is, three sets of 10 on an exercise you never do, right? no matter how light it is, there's probably going to be some delayed soreness in yeah. the days to come. Do some air yes, squats. Yes, it's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get worse if, you have, if you're obviously operating at a higher intensity. Sure. But just by 
watching the intensity, progressing the intensity doesn't mean that they probably beat some of these people up. Yeah. So um, this is, these are intense exercises that they went through and it was a, <clears throat> you said nine month study. It was, it was. And so they, you know, they made with to that end, they made it seem like they, um, you know, adequately followed up with everybody over that period. Again, with the biggest limitation being that they, you know, they had everybody set up at a community facility, like a, you know, LA fitness or YMCA, everybody was set up there. But then, you know, two weeks into the program, everybody had to go, yeah, go yeah, home yeah. and do stuff because of the shelter in place. So that's a big deal. I mean, that go, you go, you go from having 50 machines and barbells to, and treadmills and bikes to, at your disposal to at home, you know, stuff in your yeah. living room. It's not nothing, but it's a, it's a major change. But that actually probably suggests that this would have been even more effective. Potentially. Had they been able to have the uninterrupted mm -hmm. base time uh, full workouts. Yeah. Yeah. The other, in, in these interventions, the other, maybe one of the last things I wanted to mention mm -hmm. were the differences between groups a little more granularly. So we talked about the 21 sets or whatever for the strength training group specifically. So from what I can tell in the combination group, in order to, I think, allow for better tolerance of that added exercise. Combination group being yeah. Elliptical or bike and strength training. Yes. So okay. again, there was the strength group, all strength stuff, as right. we just mentioned, combo, like you mentioned, uh, conditioning plus strength, strength and then just conditioning. Got so, it. okay. So the do it appears that the dose of strength training yeah. was lower in the combination group than it was in the strength training group. Okay. So Makes I sense. would be curious to see would the outcomes as far as hemoglobin A1C lowering, would it have been higher if the volume was at, were, were equated across groups? Oh, sure. Obviously, the aerobic training group yeah, that's, can't, I mean, you're, you're controlling for aerobic training specifically. Of right. course, there's not going to be any benefit of, or any- Strength it, training in yes. that. That's a good point. So, so for example, having the 21 sets on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, mm -hmm. and then maybe doing the the conditioning on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Yep. And doing the same amounts of everything. Yeah. Again, I I want to say, yeah. In the combination group, participants were instructed to complete two strength training sessions per week, including one set of each of the strength training exercises, plus expend 42 kilojoules, kilogram body weight per week, through aerobic exercise using the same protocol as aerobic exercise. So the aerobic group was the same in both groups. Oh yeah. Yeah. So from aer aer aerobic by itself to strength training and aerobic, aerobic was the same, but the strength training protocols, I assume just by, by default because of the limited amount of time yeah. resources to it's a, it takes a lot of time to do a lot of conditioning and a lot of strength training. So I see why they did that, but I think just right at the outset there, that's a huge <laughs> drop off too. volume there. Oftentimes the results that you get from training are volume and dose dependent. So yep. if volume is not equated, I, we might presume that you're going to have a bit of a different outcome. So that's a bit of a uh, limitation, that, limitation of the study. Yeah. Again, we talked about the primary outcome, which was mm -hmm. the hemoglobin A1C lowering. Uh, the other th thing that was interesting was the secondary outcome, which looked a little more about at body composition. Specifically, what they looked at was the appendicular lean mass. And so for those that don't know what that is, <laughs> we're talking about a very specific measurement. Um, you can look at whole body lean mass, but it factors in organs and total body water, all types of that. So if we look at ALM, which Atia talks about a lot too, it's the sum of the lean tissue in the arms and legs. Okay. So it's just it's just a, a more direct measurement of you know muscle in your extremities, yeah. basically. Yeah. The higher amount of lean mass that you had, that was an additional independent predictor of lowering hemoglobin A1C. So again, just in addition to the strength training in and of itself causing a lowering, they felt if they if they controlled directly for just that increase yeah. in lean muscle mass that that conferred a benefit. There was a corollary directly between mm -hmm. the benefit and the amount of muscle mass gained. Yep. The act of gaining muscle and the muscle itself in this study was 
predictive. Doing things. That's yes. cool. That's really cool. Yeah. So it's, um, again, if it's a small study, can't really like run home with it, that it just changed the whole scope of clinical practice as it relates to, to strength training and aerobic mm-hmm. training, but it points in the direction that we sort of already know. Yep. And that's glycemic control is a real lever that can be pulled when adding physical activity. It truly makes a difference. And now we have a nice look, small snapshot at a very specific population who, you know, maybe the eye test, yep. they are, they're within rate, they're within normal body weight. They're within normal BMI. What kind of, I mean, what else can we do for them physically? Obviously right. we're, we want them to exercise. Hey, for that person, for the first 12 weeks, for the first nine months, let's say like this study, let's skew the dosing of strength training for that person. Yeah. Let's focus not, on that. Yeah. Thing. Not to say we don't bring in all the other stuff. Uh, it's just, you know, useful in that regard. That's fantastic. I'm really glad we went over that. Thank you. Uh, if you would like to look at anything else from our show, maybe past episodes or um, episodes of the original show, the Ask Joe to show that started all of this, or better still, sign up for our email, you should go to our website, askjoedematteo.com, A-S-K-J-O-E, D-I-M-A-T-T-E-O.com. That is also where we have all of the supplements, um, protein supplements, all the other things that we sell are all available there. If you want to support the, the, the show, go just buy something. You need it anyway. You might as well buy it from us, right? Um, if you have any questions, we want to hear those. Questions at askjoedematteo.com, whether it's about your A1C and diabetes or strength and conditioning training or parental rights over pharmaceutical <laughs> oh, no. awareness of children. I mean, you can send those emails to us, but we probably won't answer those. Show notes, any articles that we referenced will be available down below. And if you learned something, if you liked this show, if it sparked an interest in you, if you want to leave us a comment, maybe you have some thoughts on the whole parental rights thing. We would love to hear those. Leave them in comments down below. Send us an email, uh, rate the show, give it a thumbs up or five stars. But most importantly, please, Share it with somebody you know, somebody that you think would also benefit from uh, this information that we are trying to share, these conversations that we're trying to have. Josiah Schweinberg, our engineer. Thank you very much, sir. Michael Depish, our editor. Joyce Gibb, our nurse practitioner who handles private consultations. Big thanks to you. Diane Silverman, who handles uh, product. Terry does scheduling. Cecilia does distribution. Thank you, Dante DiMatteo. My name is Tyler Andrews. That's it for us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.